welcome to Town Hall 2022. Are you guys excited? I'm Jennifer Horn. Tech, we need one more mic up here. I'm Grant Stinchfield. Welcome, everybody. So we are so happy you're here. Uh, when you think about today, we're just days away from Election Day, and this is the kind of passion and engagement that we have that the other side doesn't. So God bless every one of you for coming out and listening to AM 870 uh, and, and Salem Media. We're so grateful. We really are. Absolutely. And right now we would ask for all of you to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, if you're, if you're Kevin Leon, Kevin Leon, remember, not De Leon, Kevin, the city councilman from LA, he botches the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance. You did it, though. Yeah, I did it. You did it, Grant. That was pretty good. All right, we want to say a very special thank you uh, to our sponsors. Please stop by and see them, by the way. Our premier sponsor, of course, James and Ken Midas Gold Group. Where are you guys? Thank you so much. DeHart Construction, Californians for School Choice, The Epic Times Newspaper, Gunslinger Auctions, and Southwest Construction. Thank you guys so much for your support. It really makes events and important days like today possible. And before we get to the program, have you heard that there is an election coming? How many of you have voted already? How many of you go, you go in person? That's what I do too. What I'd like to do right now, there are candidates in attendance today. So if you are running for office, please stand up and give a wave. I know Mark Moisier is here, Lucy Belotsky is here. It takes a lot of guts to uh, run for office, run for office in a state like California where there is so much corruption. And so we thank you all for being part of the process. It is uh, the only way we change things, right, is by standing up and, and running for office, getting bold and getting in, engaged. And so I would just like to ask all of you after today, with only a few days left, please get out of your comfort zone and make something happen. Whether you have to go grab somebody by the neck and pull them to the polls, whether you have to get their mail-in ballot, play their game, you're allowed to do that in, in California. Get people's ballots, make sure they submit them. This is how we win. Um, I have a challenge for all of you, actually. Help, since ballot harvesting is legal in this state, help at least one person get their ballot turned in that wouldn't go and vote. If you can do five, if you can do 10, we have so much power as individual citizens of this state, and the state needs it. We sure do. Um, so the three topics. Oh, are we not doing that? No. We've got a big show for you. We're going to be talking about the elections. We're going to talk about the economy. We've got a great cast of characters. But joining us first is the newest member of the Salem radio team. Officer Brandon Tatum is a speaker. He's a former athlete. He's a cop, former cop, founder of the Tatum Report, and co-founder of Blexit. And guys, he is absolutely fantastic. He hosts the Officer Tatum Show daily on AM870, The Answer, from 3 and 6 p.m. That's Officer Brandon Tatum. So because we had such a full panel, we figured we'd uh, we'd do a little two-on-one against Brandon He's Tatum. He's in the hot seat. Obviously, the two of us take a guy like this, but um, we're happy to have you here, man. Welcome to California, and we're excited to talk to you. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that, and let's get into this. Let's do it. So before we jump into the politics and the issues, for those people who are just getting to know you, you have such an amazing story. You are like a renaissance guy. You have so many things that you've done in your career. How did you get from former athlete, former law enforcement, co-founder to Blacks, and then sitting on the stage with us at AM870? Well, I have to say that I owe 100% of credit of how I got to this point, I owe it to God. And, 
And let me just say this. I know a lot of people say it because it sounds cute to say, to talk about God, but it, it genuinely, if it had not been for God uh, ordering my steps and putting me on the right path and, and me believing in God and having that relationship, I would not be here. But it, had to, it, it took God to really mold me, build me into the man that I am today, me having the confidence from having a strong father, and, and, and it really propelled me to be the professional that you see on this stage. I, I think you'd agree with this, too, that one thing, God is so great, and in my life has been so instrumental, but he does give people free will. You don't get there just hoping. you got to go make it happen, and you've really done that in so many ways. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Faith without works is dead. You can talk about it. You can say whatever you want. You can do the little prayers. But if you don't put any of these things into action, God cannot meet you. You have to, I, I look at God like a mirror. You know, the closer you get to God, the closer he gets to you. And that's how these things become possible. So tell us about Blexit, because I think Democrats certainly left women behind. They are leaving behind minorities more and more every single day. I think there is a, a movement, people really waking up. Talk about what failures kind of prompted you to create and co-found Blexit. Right. I think that the, the Democrats, the left, they care more about power than they do about the people. Mm -hmm. And that's where they lost a lot of people in this country. And Candace Owens and I were both Democrats. We were left. We were on the left. And after you become more mature as an adult, you become more informed you realize that the Democrat Party have no value for you as a black person in America. And we felt, and I, I can speak for her to a certain degree, but we felt played. Mm -hmm. We feel like some, we, they've lied to us all of these years and have deceived us. And it was our, our mission to wake up as many people as possible. And I, and I look at the um, political side as well as the religious side, I look at them in conjunction because when I got saved, I wanted to do nothing but reach out to other people, preach the gospel, and get everybody saved. Everybody in my family, everybody I saw at the gas station. I mean, I was really um, compelled. Same thing with politics. When I realized that the Democrat Party was the party of slavery, when I realized the Democrats never really cared about black voices, and they don't do, they, they still don't do it now. They only want us for voting purposes. But when I, when, I, when I made the conversion, I said, I want every single young person and older person to have access to the truth. And that's what Blexit is all about. It's not really about politics. It's about exposing people to the truth and, and allowing them to become the best version of themselves. One of the things that I think is so important about an event like this is we try to arm you with information so you can take this back out into the real world, whether it's at the water cooler. And I tell people, be talking about politics. We don't be rude to people, but be talking about it. It's that important. So. Racist becomes such an issue in this country that it is so divisive. What do you tell the white folks in here? You and I were talking out back about Black Lives Matter. I said, look, I say Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization, and, and I'm a white dude from Scarsdale, New York, right? <laughs> so what do, you tell, what do you tell white folks here? How do you breach these subjects to talk about it where you're not going to offend somebody or maybe you don't care you offend somebody? What's the answer? I guess my first approach would say that, number one, we are all Americans. I don't care what color you are. I don't care where you came from. I don't care if you came here from another country. As long as you're here legally, we are all Americans, and we're going to start with that precedent. And then moving forward, I'd say, is it true or is it not true? Because if you talk about Black Lives Matter and you say it's a fraudulent organization, I believe they're a domestic terrorist organization. I believe that's rooted in truth. And it doesn't matter what color you are. And, and, and I know that there will be obstacles, right? Because in America, for whatever reason, people have been brainwashed that if you are white, that somehow if you speak out against Black Lives Matter, you are racist. This is what they want to paint you as. But you have to focus on the truth. And if you're telling the truth, forget what they have to say. I almost said something else, but I'm trying to be a good Christian up here. <laughs> forget what they are saying. You tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. And I think for so many people, it was an awakening to learn about the manifesto of Black Lives Matter. I think at the beginning, you think, well, of course, Black Lives Matter, we, all of our lives should matter. They do matter, especially if you're a Christian, right? Everybody should have that same value. But I think that we had this awakening when the manifesto went up, and we realized that this is so steeped in socialism. And they really do. The left, whether it's Black Lives Matter or not, or any other organization, the left has kind of pushed into this mode where they want to destroy the country that we have. They don't see America as the solution. They see it as the problem. 
and they want to recreate it in whatever socialist imagery they say fit. And I think a lot of people have finally seen that, and that's probably because Black Lives Matter finally actually started telling us who they really are if you're paying attention. Yeah, and I, and I think they're, they're, they've lost uh, connection with God. That's pretty much why all it is. They want the government to be your God. They, they've lost track of believing that you need a strong father in the home. On their website, they wanted to reimagine. The word reimagine, when you hear them say reimagine, that means they want to destroy. Mm -hmm. They want to reimagine policing. They want to reimagine a nuclear family. And that's a telltale sign that they have no vested interest in doing what's right for this country. They want the government to be your baby daddy. They want the government to be your father. They want the government to be your God. And we have seen that in very vividly um, through some of the things that have gone on in Black Lives Matter. And I'm glad they've been exposed. Candace Owens has a documentary out exposing them like nobody's business. Over $80 million that they raised. They gave over $1.6 million to LGBTQ community stuff, some of which those organizations were pushing for women to do sexual things on camera, uh, uh, all kinds of sexual mis misbehaving that they promoted. And not one ounce of that money went to a black organization. Not one bit of that money that they raised went to the families of any of those dead black men that they hustled the country for, or hustled to raise money on, on their behalf. So we, we've seen it as, as sure as the noonday sun, and it's all always up to us to tell the truth and expose a lie. You know, just as you brought up your dad, you said you had a strong father. I have a great dad who's right there in the front row. It's so important. I think we're, we're suffering a man crisis. We're suffering a male crisis. And it seems that the some of the motivations of the left are to create, they're taking away the family, right? They want to destroy the nuclear family. And then we get these men who are engaging in mass shootings who look like they are so lost and don't have any guidance. Are we suffering a man crisis in our country right now? A thousand percent. A thousand percent. And I think there's a, a lineage. I always go back to God because that's the central focus of my life. You have God. You have, you know, Jesus is the head of the church. The man is the head of the household. When you don't line that thing up like this, you see all kinds of chaos and confusion. You look at any statistical data, children are more likely to drop out of school, more likely to end up in prison. I think it's like 75 percent of young people who do not have fathers end up going into the, or at least 75 percent of the people who are in the prison system or in the juvenile detention system, system did not have a father. So we have a crisis, not only a crisis of not, um, I, I guess, lifting up fathers and, and believing as a country that they're important to be in the family, but also we're raising feckless men. Some men are afraid to be men. They have this concept called toxic masculinity. Yeah. Well, freedom was built on toxic masculinity. We, if you ask me, we need more toxic masculinity. We need more young men that are willing to put on that uniform and go out and serve this country with their lives. We need more young men and women to put on the uniform locally and put that badge on, go into that burning fire, show up as a first responder, and serve your community. Quit looking for a handout, especially men. You should not be walking around looking for a handout and somebody to give you something. I, I understand a hand up, but not a handout. And we need more young men to be strong, and, they, and how do the young men become strong? Because they have an example from another strong man. The reason I'm here today is because of my father, Mr. Bobby Tatum. He retired twice from the fire department. I don't know why he want to keep working. But now he, he just we, we just pinned his badge on like a couple weeks ago. He's the, uh, the, the chief of the fire department in Keller, Texas now. He retired from Waco, retired from Fort Worth. But I saw my father live by example. He wasn't a big talker. He didn't sit me down like I do my son and I talk to him. Hey, man. Understand what's going on. My daddy didn't talk much, but he lived the life before me. He went to work every single doggone day. I remember my father used to study for his exams. He used to put his earphones on. He used to sit in there, and that, that book was this thick. He had four kids, and my dad used to study hard. And it really affected me. And it, everything that I do, I said, man, if my daddy can do that, I got some big shoes to fill. My father, my father grew up in a project. His daddy wasn't there. When my father went on, he became a, a fire, firefighter when he was 19 years old. He got his, he, he had only graduated high school when he started the fire department. He went back to get his bachelor's degree, went and got his master's degree. There is no excuse when you see your father, a man that you share bloodline with, go out and hustle, and it makes you a better person. We need more men like that. I, I think everyone will agree. I'm a father myself. I got a 13-year-old boy. It's the hardest job in America is being a dad. I screw it up all the time. But one thing I'm teaching my son now 
is to be fearless, strong, and even capable of violence, but have restraint. But if God forbid he needs to be violent, I will teach him how to protect his family to be violent if, if, if evil comes calling. Yep. I couldn't agree more. Jordan Peterson had made reference to this yeah, point. He did, that exactly. You, you need to have it in you. <laughs> You don't have to use it. You know, the most measured man is a man who's capable of it, but know how to have self-restraint. The man that you know, if you get in trouble, you're going to call him on the phone, and you know he's going to take care of business. But he's not the type of person that's going to lose his temper and go off on people for no reason. But having that restraint is the key. You know, every day you tell a story from the start of your show that goes through the entirety of the show. If you have not listened yet to Officer Brandon Tatum, do it right now. You are fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us today. A big round of applause for Officer Brandon Tatum. Let's go, Brandon. It's got to be the best thing that ever happened to him, right? <laughs> Hi, it's Mike Gallagher. I start every day by reading through the stories at Daybreak Insider. It's a look at today's most compelling stories, how they're covered by the media, and provides responses from key conservatives in media and politics. Over a quarter million people get Daybreak Insider by email daily, and it's available to you at no cost. Go to daybreakinsider.com and plug it into your email. That's daybreakinsider.com. In five minutes, you'll be the most informed person in the office. That's daybreakinsider.com. Town Hall Review with yours truly, Hugh Hewitt, the go-to conservative podcast where you get your weekly news and analysis. I wake up America to interview hard-to-reach politicians and today's leaders. And you know my friends, Mike Gallagher, the happy conservative warrior, Dennis Prager, passionate about preserving America. Charlie Kirk, speaking the language of our nation's young people. Sebastian Gorka, fighting for America first. And Officer Tatum, delivering the truth to people. Passionate voices for passionate listeners. Subscribe right now on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. That's Town Hall Review with Hugh Hewitt. In the house. <laughs> we got the next theme music or no? I might sing. Ooh, I know what that means. Next up on the panel, the chief architect of Prager University and host of the show, her nine to noon.
The great one, Mark Levin. to have all of these great men on this stage to be with us all today. Thank you all for being here. Okay, so Town Hall is going to be divided into three sections. We're going to be talking about the elections, both 2022 and 2024, the economy, inflation, recession, what inflation if you're Joe Biden, and the state of California. We'll be talking about all three of those things. And we'll do about 20 minutes in each section. So we ask that as you respond, you get about two minutes for each panelist to <laughs> respond, which I say every year, but, you two know. Minutes. We got a bunch of radio hosts up here. Two minutes is going to be rough for, uh, for all of us. <laughs> but it is part of the rules, so uh, we'll, we'll see how good we do, them, do there. Um, then we'll turn it over to the other panelists for a one-minute response. I guess you and I just get to pick whoever we want for That's that one-minute right. response. We're taking bribes, guys. And then, uh, and then we'll go on to the next question. And so uh, they said there's warning lights here, but I don't know if we have warning lights, do we? Flash them if we've got them. Oh, right back there. There we go. Oh, look Looks like that. Officer okay. Tatum Park. You guys see that in the back, back there? there? I didn't know about that. That means <laughs> stop. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's start first. And actually, we'll start with you, Sage. You're right up here. Paul Pelosi, you may have heard, ran into a little trouble at his house. Um, was trying to break out, apparently. The door was broken coming out rather than going in. What do you think about how the media has been framing this as a right-wing attack, January 6th-style insurrectionists? Uh, I mean, they don't even tell the real story, which is getting weirder by the second. Yeah, it is getting weirder by the second. And I was attacked on Twitter by a host on MSNB Hee-Haw because, because I said... Uh, Pelosi had a rough six months. He gets busted for DUI. He gets attacked by a guy with a, a blunt object. So he was hammered twice in six months. <laughs> oh. Come on, that was obvious. It was right there. You had it. It was right. That, that, that joke could have written itself. And I got hammered, uh, pardon the expression. And he said, this is the modern Republican Party. Somebody being that callous to make a joke out of what happened to him. Now, I wouldn't have made the joke had he not, the doctor said he's going to make a complete recovery. But more than that, it's interesting. They're connecting the dots between this guy, who, by the way, had a, had a Black Lives Matter uh, sign in his house, also a rainbow flag in his house. So they're calling him a right-wing conspiracy, uh, and we're not even sure that he is. But they didn't connect the dots regarding the George Floyd riots for four months uh, in 2020. Uh, you had a bunch of people out there. Uh, 25 cops were, were killed. 25 people were killed. 2,000 cops injured, uh, about $2 billion worth of damage. And for some reason, the media did not seem to connect the dot between that and this assertion, wrong-headed assertion, that the police are engaging in systemic racism. Um, they were happy to label this as something that was triggered by Donald Trump's hateful rhetoric. What's more hateful than referring to half the country as believers in semi-fascism? And Obama didn't say jack about that. So it's the media's attempt to argue that uh, people that support Trump, Republicans in general, 
or hateful, vicious, nasty people uh, who have violent uh, supporters. Never mind all the people who went to the streets for four days after Trump won in 2016, all across the country, setting fire, uh, police cars on fire, uh, and nobody seemed to suggest that they were violent people. So it's a lie, it's offensive, uh, and this rhetoric of Joe Biden referring to MAGA extremists, uh, and again, calling us semi-fascists, uh, is exactly what they've got. They can't talk about inflation, they can't talk about crime, they can't talk about the borders, they can't talk about gasoline prices, because we've got abortion, election integrity, oh, and by the way, you voted for Trump, therefore you must be a racist. You know, Dennis, it, it seems to me to, to play off of what Larry was just saying, that the Democrats are the only ones I know where political leaders call for violence. You heard, you heard Maxine Waters say, get up in their faces. Madonna says, I've thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. And yet the media plays into this that all of these people in the room, everyone we're looking at right here, these are the, these are the terrorists of the nation. These are all domestic terrorists. What do you say, Dennis? So what I say is very sad, actually, and I never thought I'd say it. My field of study, as many of you know, was communist affairs. That's what it was called. I was one of seven students at Columbia in that, in that tiny department. I learned Russian in order to read the Soviet communist newspaper Pravda. To this day, I'm not sure I can say I would like a tuna sandwich. But I can say that the Israeli aggressors committed aggression against the peace-loving people of the Arab Middle East. That I can say in Russian, because I learned Pravda Russian. I would never have imagined that my learning how to read a Soviet newspaper would prepare me to read American newspapers. And I, I say this with no exaggeration and only sadness. It never occurred to me that what I was studying in my 20s in the 1970s would be useful in America 50 years later. It, 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 it's it's mind-blowing. Everyone in this room, virtually everyone, I can't say for everyone, of course, but virtually everyone in this room and my colleagues up here know that we cannot trust the mainstream media, that their task is to defend the left and not defend the truth. The New York Times begins with a lie every day on its front page. All the news that's fit to print, that is not true. All the news that is beneficial to the left and the Democratic Party, that is fit to print. And that's the bigger issue. What happened in the Pelosi House is of, is of some significance, but it's only significant insofar as can we trust the mainstream media. The good news is that we have massive amount of other media that are committed to truth in this country. They don't have that nearly as much outside of the United States. In Canada, you might have the National Post. When I interviewed uh, former Prime Minister Harper at a PragerU event, I'll never forget, it blew my mind. He said, Dennis, the CBC is way worse than CNN. That's the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. That blew my mind. This is a former Prime Minister of Canada saying that. So our, our battle is with truth, is with the lies, that are purveying themselves as truth. That's the biggest issue of all. The good news is we have a lot of sources of truth that we can trust. Seb, I want you to chime in on this too, and uh, maybe with this angle. It seems, that I saw someone on Twitter say that political violence is on the rise because of the summer of love, as some called it, in 2020 with the Black Lives Matter riots. Um, do you think that that's true? Is there really an uptick in political violence? Has this stuff been happening? Or is this just, or is this kind of just self-created because the media likes to, to focus on these things? Well, let me answer the question by quoting somebody on Twitter. We love that. Her name is Christine Pelosi. And she said the following. Rand Paul's neighbor was right. Mm -hmm. Now, who's normalizing violence? We have political violence in America. We have the most senior senator, Chuck Schumer, say in public, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, 
you will reap the whirlwind. What happens a few months later? Somebody travels from California with a gun, a knife, and zip ties to assassinate Justice Kavanaugh in front of his family. That's not a MAGA hat-wearing Republican. That is a Democrat. We have a radical party in this nation that has normalized and embraced violence. With regards to this attack, some interesting questions. Have you ever seen a house burglary where the glass of the window is on the outside? To be fair, it was Nancy just, Pelosi's just a house, though. <laughs> you would Look try at to the aerial out. photographs. I'm just asking questions. How is the glass on the outside of the door? How is the home that belongs to the woman who actually runs the Capitol Police? The Speaker of the House is actually the commander of the Capitol Police. She decides. She's the one who said, stand down the week before January 6th. We do not need the National Guard that President Trump has offered us. She made that decision. How is her home not ringed with steel? Where is the camera footage? Why is it 2 a.m. in the morning the police do a wellness checkup at 2 a.m. and then the 9-11 call talks about David, my friend. And of course, I know you've all seen it before, MAGA is full of pro-hemp nudists. <laughs> this guy's a pro-hemp nudist from Canada who may be here illegally, so he may be an illegal alien. So we wish Paul a speedy recovery, but one thing I know, the FBI deploying a GO team to San Francisco for a house break-in, uh, yeah, this story is going to be deep sixed very, very soon. As to Dennis's point, the reason why we're here, because there are sources of actual news, Salem, think of this. When we were on our little tour, what was it, a week ago? As we are on our tour with Mike Gallagher, with Dennis, the New York Times writes a hit piece that they thought was a hit piece that called us, Salem, the juggernaut of American radio. That's why we're here today. Amen. And, and I would piggyback the reason we are the juggernaut of talk radio is because of all of you in the room. It's not us that's powerful. Absolutely. It's the support of all of you that make us powerful. And, uh, and don't forget that power that, that you guys have, and it is yours. And I always just feel humbled to speak on your behalf. Um, Charlie, to, to go on to what Sebastian was just saying, Twitter, two, twofold here, Twitter and the Pelosi break-in. Hillary Clinton tweets out that it's a MAGA Republican that's responsible for this. Elon Musk retweets it with an article spelling out everything Sebastian just laid out <laughs> for us. That's a very different Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, there's some, uh, there's some new management at Twitter we're already starting to see. By the way, I want to talk a little briefly about that. I have an open email. You guys can always email me, freedom at charliekirk.com. I believe Elon purchasing Twitter is the single most consequential private transaction in American history. Nothing comes even close. You guys can, if you guys have another piece in history that is close to a $44 billion purchase of the largest public square to liberate the ability to be able to incubate elite thought, I think it's the Louisiana purchase of our time. I really do. Now, you might say, oh, Charlie, Elon is, you know, he's not one of us. He's already firing the executives. He's already restoring accounts. And he responds to Hillary Clinton with an article that says that this very well might have been a prostitute with Paul Pelosi. We don't know, but it's a question. That's Elon, by the way. I'm just quoting Elon. And so we, we don't know. That's the world's richest man just asking a question of which the media should probably be doing right now. So look. I don't want to talk about this. It's obvious that the media is so unbelievably desperate. They think of this as an October surprise. This thing is about to turn on its head because of Salem's post, because of a liberated Twitter. I'm going to tell you what the next 48 hours is going to be like, okay? The media, as they always do, they went after Covington. They went after Smollett. They went after all these fake hoaxes. And then all of a sudden, we start to dig into the weeds, we being patriots, we being free thinkers. And all of a sudden, we're going to get the word out. Because there's a lot more to this story. We don't know what it is. But I said on air on Friday, this is very suspicious. Like, who runs around San Francisco in their underwear? Like, the whole thing's, like, really bizarre, right? Well, well, I guess a lot of people run around in San Francisco in their underwear. But, 
the point is the whole thing is just bizarre and you're going to see the next 48 hours the media is now going to be like Pelosi and their family deserves privacy with this matter I guarantee you that's going to happen in the next 48 hours and I don't want to talk about Paul Pelosi's alleged activities at 2 a.m. But we have to correct the narrative because if they're going to try to use this as a way to steer the midterm narrative, then we can't let that happen. But the reality is this. The regime is desperate. They're paranoid and they're worried because I think something is building in this country that is going to shock the world in eight days from now in a very, very significant way. Mark? This means nothing. <laughs> Zero. How many people were murdered in Chicago yesterday? In Philadelphia? Who runs those cities? Defund the police. Pelosi and her party own an apology to the police in this country. Now I go by two simple thought processes here. Number one, the Democrat Party hates America. The Democrat Party has never bought into America. From slavery to segregation to Jim Crow to American Marxism. The Democrat Party promoted the Klan. The Democrat Party refused to outlaw under FDR lynching. The Democrat Party got behind eugenics with Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood. We didn't do that. It wasn't our party. On top of that, the media, the New York Times, the New York Times covered up the Holocaust. Now, shouldn't that have been the biggest issue for any newspaper in the 1930s and 40s? FDR wanted them to cover it up, so it covered it up. The New York Times promoted Stalin with Walter Durante and the slaughter of the Ukrainians. And they knew he was lying about what the Ukrainians were facing. The New York Times helped install Castro. Who gives a flying you-know-what what the New York Times thinks? <laughs> that corporation? What kind of a corporation is this? Now, this corporation is filled with lies and just because it calls itself the media doesn't mean anything to me, considering all the blood it has on its hands, even today. Look what's going on in Iran. Is that being properly reported? It's mostly being ignored. And I'm supposed to sit here and worry about an attack on Paul Pelosi. I wish Paul Pelosi all the best. I really do. I wish him well. God bless him. Now let's move on, for God's sakes. <laughs> I can help you with that. Let's talk about election integrity. You know, we hear a lot about the red wave coming, and I think there is probably everybody in this room is worried that the election will not be secure. So uh, we'll start with you, Mark. Do you think that the RNC has done enough to shore up the voting problems we saw in 2020? It's an okay. easy one. I don't give a damn what the RNC is <laughs> let me Let me tell you this. It's the grassroots that's going to save this country. It's the grassroots in the Reagan Revolution, in the Tea Party movement, in the Trump Revolution. It's the parents and the grassroots that are going to do it now. I don't get on TV and radio and say, oh, the red wave's coming, baby, because there's a certain percentage of us that say, okay, then I don't need to vote. Politics is like military operations without the ammunition. You fight like you're behind. You have to take that hill. I don't give a damn what the polls say. It doesn't matter. This party needs to be crushed. And it needs to be crushed from California to Maine, from Texas to North Dakota. We need to send a signal that we love our country, that we know what a man is, we know what a woman is. Keep your damn hands off our children.
keep your hands off our automobiles. And we're not about to sit still for a depression or anything of the kind. Now, real quick, as for violence, Republicans violent? We can barely get them to speak up, let alone violent. <laughs> the riots in this country, have you ever been to a Republican riot? Do Republicans burn down cities? No, what do they do? I mean, I, I'm thinking, oh, the, the, the violent Republicans. Don't buy this crap. Just move on with your lives. Fight like hell. Make sure you vote. Make sure everybody you know votes. And then they're going to see something happen that they're going to wish never did happen. You're going to push back, and you're going to take your country back. And then after that, we're going to hold the Republicans responsible. Last five seconds. Sorry. That red light's going on there like it's a bordello back there. I, uh, not that I would know. But anyway, we have to hold their feet to the fire because it's enough with managing the disaster that they're handed. We want them to fight back for some freedom. Paul Laxalt once told me, Adam Laxalt's grandfather, who was a confidant of Reagan's, was the governor and then senator from Nevada. He said, when I was a young man, I met with him in Washington, and he said to me, Every day we meet here, Mark, we lose a little more of our freedom. How about we gain a little bit more of our freedom every day? So I, I agree with Mark that the Republican Party, I, mean, I blast leadership of the ruling class elites that run that party every single day. But Larry, I'm going to ask you because you were a candidate. You were a Republican candidate. Without them in the courtrooms around the country, much less California as well, without them having people to watch the polls, we can't do some of this stuff on our own. We can't go sue these state courts and, and governors across the country. How do we balance that with what Mark is talking about and the movement of all these people with the need for some centralized party to watch out over our rights? Well, it still is local. And you saw what they did in Georgia. Uh, and the Major League Baseball took away the All-Star game from Atlanta because they claimed that the local politicians, Republican politicians, were imposing voter suppression in Georgia. You see the results. More votes than ever before as a percentage of eligible voters. More blacks are voting than whites. Are they going to apologize to uh, Atlanta for having taken away the All-Star game and giving it to Denver? And I want to say something about this election integrity stuff. I mentioned Joe Biden referring to Trump supporters are semi-fascist because they refused to accept the election of 2020. Hillary ran around for the entirety of Trump's term and referred to him as illegitimate and said the election was stolen with far less evidence. Jay Johnson, the DHS secretary, testified under oath that the Russians tried mightily to change vote tallies. They failed to change a single one. Yet 66% of Democrats, according to a poll by YouGov in 2018, believe the Russians, quote, changed vote tallies in order to elect Donald Trump. Jay Johnson also said, I have no idea whether or not the Russian interference altered the outcome of the election. 78% of Democrats, according to a Gallup poll, believe the Russian interference altered the outcome of the election. That's the effect Hillary's big lie has had on how Democrats think of the election in 2016. Yet Hillary's social media platforms have never been shut down. To this day, Al Gore will tell you that the Supreme Court put George W. Bush in the White House, referred to him as President Select Jimmy Carter, said publicly without any evidence in 2019 that the Russians put Donald Trump in the White House. Benny Thompson is the chair of the January 6th committee, the, the Insurrection Committee. First week of January 2005, he joined 30 other Democrats and Barbara Boxer with the support of Senator Clinton to overturn the re election results in Ohio, claiming that the d voting machines had been tampered with without any evidence. Nobody referred to them as insurrectionists who are undermining the foundation of our republic. This is the double standard to which we've been subjected to. And thank God, Carrie Lake finally rattled off a whole bunch of these examples, including Stacey Abrams, who for a couple of years after 2018 claimed that she lost her race because of voter suppression and then recently denied that she denied it. She's a, she's a voter denier denier. 
Charlie, we were talking about some predictions, and you have you have a few for 2022. Uh, what do you think it looks like? On can, the day? Can, can I just on election integrity? I, I want to break some news here. So um, many of us on this stage were participants in Dinesh D'Souza's groundbreaking movie, 2000 Mules. And that movie, which will change history, happened because of two very brave people. True the Votes, Catherine Engelbrecht, and Greg Phillips, who was the man who got the data on how they stole the election. Now, I have a request to everybody in this room. Would you please raise your hands if you have a Facebook or Twitter or social media account? Would you raise your hands? Good. <laughs> I know you do, Charlie. <laughs> if you don't, you need to make one by midnight tonight. Because Catherine and Greg, at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning, will be jailed by Judge Kevin uh, Kenneth Hoyt in Houston because they refused to reveal the source for their uh, exposure of the Chinese election company Connex that illegally took election data from America and moved it to servers in China. They will be arrested at 7 a.m. They are heroes. They are heroes. I want everybody in this room today to go online and to support Catherine and Greg Phillips. We need to put pressure on this activist judge who wants to muzzle people who are telling the truth about the 2020 election. Will you do that? Thank you. Extraordinary. Dennis, are you, are you nervous of, of them coming after any one of us on this stage, including yourself? <laughs> no. Uh, I am. Uh, I, we're, it's, I'm answering you honestly. I don't, I sleep well. I do a happiness hour. So uh, I, I don't walk around nervous. So I gave you an honest answer. Intellectually, rationally, is there a reason to fear that they would come after any one of us? If they have enough power in Washington, they would. That's correct. They would like to suppress everything that is dissenting. As I've said so often, I'm afraid to say it again, but repetition is the mother of learning. So here goes. There has never been an instance since Vladimir Lenin in 1917 that the left has taken power anywhere and not suppressed dissent. If the left does not suppress dissent, the left goes out of business. They cannot handle dissent. Did you ever wonder why they have such massive attempts to suppress conservative speakers on a campus? They have four years to indoctrinate those kids on campus. Why do they give a damn if any one of us, or a Ben Shapiro, or a Dave Rubin, or a Heather McDonald shows up for an hour and a half? And I'll tell you why. Deep down they know that we can undo four years of indoctrination in 90 minutes. That is the reason. They are right to, from their amoral, immoral perspective, they are right to suppress dissent. I'd just like to add one point when it was stated here that it will come from beneath the change and not necessarily from above, although both are important and we all recognize that. There is a vote that every American makes that is not at the ballot box. It is at the local school. When you send your children to a typical American school, you are voting on behalf of the most pernicious force in American life, the current American school. They are ruining our children. They are ruining them. That is not too strong a term. So I'd like to make a suggestion, as Seb suggested about establishing a social media presence, I would like to suggest the following. If you have children in school, take them out. 
Simple as that. It, that would be more effective in undermining the left's destruction of the country than any voting that we could do. That, if we took our kids out of their schools, that would be it. It would end the left as we know it. But if you are not prepared to do that, and you or for example, you're a grandparent, this is what you should say to your child. I, thank God, am more comfortable than you. I have some more money than you. The best thing I can do with it is pay for your child. If you take your child out of school and homeschool your child, I will pay the difference in your family income that you will lose if you have a, a homeschooling situation in your home. That is the best thing you can do as a parent because you run a serious risk of your grandchild saying that he is a she or she is a he. 300,000 17 to 25 year olds in this country in 2020 said they were not the sex that they really are. 300,000. That was up by double over 2017, and this is 2022. It's undoubtedly gone up another 50%. It is the greatest lie in history, perhaps, that you can become a member of the other sex. You can act like one. You can look like one. I fully acknowledge that. You cannot become one. You are either a male or a female. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Charlie, back to you. Give us your predictions, the, uh, what you think the next day after Election Day will look like for us. Yes, yeah, so a couple things, and I do want to comment on the Republican establishment as well, because I've been pretty upset the last couple weeks with what I've been seeing, which is a betrayal of amazing candidates across the country that are left to fend for themselves. It's a very serious problem, and we should never forget it. We're not going to know for probably a week, so brace yourself for impact. Uh, Georgia, Arizona, and Pennsylvania are already telling us that it's going to take a week for us to get election results. So just get ready for that. Remember, you get what you put up with. And Brian Kemp and Raffensperger and Ducey in Arizona were not bold enough to get the election reform changes necessary. Now, I hope there's no fraud. I hope that we overwhelm the fraud. I think we will. I think that Kerry Lake is going to win the governor's race in Arizona. I really do. And. So we're fighting right now like crazy to make sure Blake Masters wins against the fraud of Mark Kelly. But let me tell you the problem. Blake Masters has raised about 15 to 20 million dollars. Mark Kelly has raised 75 million dollars. And Mitch McConnell is instead spending money in Alaska to go defeat a great Republican. Nine million dollars has been spent on defeating a Trump endorsed candidate, Kelly Shabaka. Meanwhile, Blake Masters is being outspent in Arizona. Meanwhile, he pulled out all the money in New Hampshire with a great candidate, Don Bolduc, and he goes up in the polls and he says, maybe I'll do a million. You see, McConnell is not counting votes, he's counting seats. And this is a huge problem. I'm telling you right now, he has betrayed the grassroots of this country and has allowed our candidates and left them on an island. Nine million dollars in Alaska while our candidates can't raise money while we are being outspent at every single corner in turn. So you ask the question, have we done enough with election integrity? No, because the Republican Party is the Vichy French. And if you don't know what the Vichy French is, they were, na they were Nazi collabor collaborators in France that would much rather be on their side than on the actual resistance side. It's the Uniparty. They would rather have business as usual. So yes, we got to win. I hope we have a Senate majority. And then I hope the grassroots shows up and gets rid of every single one of these packs in the Republican establishment because they are taking your money and lying to you and sending it to people like Lisa Murkowski. One footnote to Charlie, if I may. So the, the RNC, the GOP, Mark's absolutely right. I, I couldn't care less what they do because they want to be in the minority. They, they want to play footsie under the table with the Dems. That's all they want to do. But we can't just blame them because guess what? It's our country. It's not their country, it's our country. My wife, my muse, detests politics. She utterly, she's a very wise woman, and she detests it. As of last week, she is a senior election officer in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Right? Why? 
Why? Because she doesn't want them to steal elections. When she got back from her certification as a senior election officer last week, she recounted to me, and this is in a Commonwealth that we own, okay? Young Kin is the governor, which means we control the election architecture, the committees, the chairpeople. She told me there are 300 open positions for senior election officers for the GOP in just her county. So guess what? You don't like the RNC? You don't like the GOP? Take it over! It's very simple. All right, we are moving on to our next section. Obviously, Biden and the Democrats like to spend like drunken sailors. Don't disparage and drunken sailors <laughs> like that. <laughs> he was one once. Um, let's start about well. Let's start with Ukraine and Russia. We are involved in this um, in this war now financially, and it seems that there is no end in sight. We are not at a place where we should be spending money outlandishly. Um, Seb, we'll start with you. What should our role be moving forward with Ukraine and Russia? Oh, very easy. And it, it, it galls me as an immigrant to this country, as a legal immigrant, whose father was arrested betrayed and tortured by a secret police officer in a communist regime, much like Vladimir Putin, who was a KGB colonel. When I hear people who say they are putative conservatives say, doesn't matter, ignore that. Or even worse, even worse, that Vladimir Putin is a good guy saving Western Christianity. He's an atheist. He's a former KGB colonel. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not for sending pallets of cash to Kiev. It is a problematic country. It has a history of corruption. But to say the diminutive Jewish president is a far-right Nazi is worse than bad taste. And here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. If you're a patriot, if you believe in America, if you believe 1776 means something, well, guess what? This is Ukraine's 1776. And there's only one way to deal with a bully, and that's all he is. You punch them in the nose. I'm not interested in the 82nd Airborne landing in Kherson. I want the Ukrainians to make Russian invaders bleed until they leave. And they will, because this is a nation that has had eight million of its citizens murdered by the Kremlin in the Holomodor. They will fight, not to the last man, they will fight to the last 12-year-old girl who can pick up an AK, because that's the Ukrainians. And one last thing about isolationism and the Neo-Buchananites and Tucker every, and everybody else. Let me remind everyone in this room, if America hadn't been assisted by other nations, you'd still be a British colony. Okay? Without the French, the French assisting us with naval assets in our Revolutionary War, we never would have won. So helping other nations fight for their freedom against bullies, in my book, as the son of somebody who suffered under communism, yes, absolutely. So one of the things I've said, and I'm going to go down to Mark, Mark on this one is I think the Ukraine-Russia situation is a situation of corrupt versus corrupt. It's not good versus evil. They're two corrupt countries. So you waste money, too, by pouring it in there if we don't have checks and balances, and we should have a better set of checks and balances. Mark, that whole situation, the possibility of World War III with China on the move and North Korea, Russia, Iran, you name it, all the players, is that a legitimate possibility with Joe Biden at the helm? Well, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what, are you trying to set me up? <laughs> Let me give you my opinion on this. What the hell do you expect the Ukrainians to do? To surrender? They were invaded. Two million of their people have been moved forcibly into Russian concentration camps. They're raping their women. They're torturing their men. There are not missiles landing in Russian territory. All those attacks and missiles are landing in Ukrainian territory. We made an arrangement in 1994, and so did Vladimir Putin, and so did Britain, 
at for surrendering all of their nuclear weapons in Ukraine to the Russians, we, Russia, and Britain would help secure Ukraine's territorial sovereignty. While Russia, just like Stalin turning on Hitler, Russia decided they're not. How many up here read what Vladimir Putin wrote 18 months ago in his essay? How many up here read it? How many out there read it? Nobody. 9,000 words. Ukraine's the first country. Then Poland. He's talking about Eastern Europe. Imagine if Ronald Reagan was told, don't confront the Soviets in Afghanistan. Don't confront the Soviets in Nicaragua. Don't confront the Soviets in the Middle East. Don't confront the Soviets in Libya. Don't confront the Soviets. They have nuclear missiles and they may shoot them at us. The Soviet Union would still be standing. Ukraine doesn't have nuclear missiles aimed at us. Russia does. And they keep threatening to use them. So let's pretend that we pull everything out right now. What signals does that send to every nation with nuclear arms that hates us? We will be blackmailed forevermore. Because the big enemy is China. With Iran catching up with its nukes. Russia, Vladimir Putin, is desperate because they have nothing but the military. And we should be actually quite pleased. It turns out his military is shit. Excuse my French. And unlike Afghanistan, where we poured in hundreds of billions of dollars in equipment, Ukraine's taking our equipment and they're kicking Russia's ass. Did you ever think that would happen, ever? No, nobody's talking about a blank check. What moron other than Biden is talking about a blank check? I'm not. Yeah, so you want to tighten that up? That's fine. But we have Iran on the precipice. We have other countries on the precipice. So we have a rotten, lousy commander in chief. I agree with you 100%. But you don't throw NATO to the wolves. NATO was created to protect us. Some of us have ancestors who bled in Europe and bled all over this world. I'll tell you what I told President Trump. We fought for that land. We don't turn it over to Stalin's successor. Those are our allies. We put that in place to protect us as much as we did to protect those NATO countries. That's my view. I, I think my... my my, I will, Charlie, yeah. My, my point I was... I can't hear very well, Dan. Uh, understood. My, my point by mentioning Joe Biden at the helm is because we didn't have this situation under President Trump. We didn't have to send billions under President now. Trump because they I knew agree. President Trump would do something about it. President Trump told me, looked me in the eye at Mar-a-Lago and said, I told Vladimir Putin if he goes into Ukraine, I'll I bomb agree. Moscow. And he said, those big, beautiful rooftops you got, kiss them goodbye. I, I agree 100%. But we don't. Charlie? Yeah, I run a risk here at disagreeing with uh, some of my amazing mentors, so I apologize in advance, Mark. Is that okay? <laughs> Why don't you just pass them? <laughs> well, because I, I think, I'm just I, I actually think the majority of the room will agree with me, because um, I think I speak for a lot of people here in the American grassroots with, we don't trust Joe Biden after Afghanistan obviously. And I don't know, I was pretty insulted by leaders of the Republican Party that sprinted to the Senate floor to send $75 billion to Ukraine while we're invaded every single day in our own country. And people say it's, it's not either or. Well, it kind of is, though, because our leaders, when was the last time McConnell gave $4 billion to go give us a border wall? It is either or. They did not give the money for Trump to have a border wall. They never signed a declaration invasion when we had two million people cross into our country. So that's number one. Number two, 
is this, which is, what does success look like in Ukraine? I don't know. I mean, I want to hear it from Joe Biden. He says the elimination of Russian presence in Ukraine. Again, the great one knows far more about this than I do, and so does Dr. Gorka. But I don't know. I don't trust this current regime to end things quickly in Ukraine or cheaply. In fact, it feels like another foreign entanglement that's going to probably get us stumbling into spending more tens of billions of dollars that we don't have. And do you trust Mark Milley and Lloyd Austin to lead us into another proxy war into Ukraine? And I, I know there will be a response from that. But the final thing I'll say is this, is we're a nation in crisis. Shouldn't a nation of crisis probably take priority of things that are happening here, of the most suicidal, depressed, alcohol-addicted, psychiatric drug-addicted generation in history, hyperinflation and crime? My main perspective is this, and I'm no isolationist is our nation is crumbling in more ways than one. And I want our leaders to not look abroad and to have, say, you know what, the most important thing is Ukraine. I'm not saying anyone's saying that, but it sure feels that way with the regime media. And I'm very afraid, I'm deathly afraid, that after we've now spent $75 billion in a proxy war, and you guys can correct me, but doesn't, don't, don't the Eastern Ukrainians want to be part of Russia? They're ethnically Russian? They voted to be part of Russia? Not, not anymore, they don't well, ask them. They voted 87% to be part of... Are you asking me? Are you asking me? Well, I'm maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they didn't vote 87%. But here's the final thing I'll say, is that the American grassroots are getting crushed by all these issues, and their leaders are sending money abroad for something they can't define that has the highest stakes imaginable, which is nuclear Armageddon. I let think me, it's let a huge mistake. Let me just say this. Conservatism goes through cycles like this. I'll call it isolationism, you call it which I don't know what you would call it. <clears throat> it went through it in the 30s with the first American first movement, which is nothing like the current American first movement, led by folks like Lindbergh. How many think Churchill was one of the greatest leaders of all time? <laughs> Churchill begged the United States for help because they couldn't beat Hitler by themselves. Churchill saw what Hitler was going to become. We were in a depression. You don't get to pick your enemies, and you don't get to pick your timing. They pick it. We're not going to war with anybody, Charlie. We're not sending a single troop over there, which we would all oppose. Those aren't American forces fighting. Those are homes of these people who are being destroyed. And if you were to say, Mark, we can't get involved in every case, I agree. But this is the tip of the point for Eastern Europe. And if Russia rolled through Ukraine in three days, it wouldn't be wasting time in Ukraine today. Why do you think Poland has given virtually all of its weaponry to Ukraine? Romania has given virtually all of its weaponry to Ukraine. The Balkan states have given virtually all of their equipment to Ukraine. England, which likes to stay out of most things, is doing the same thing because they lived through World War II. Some things just don't change. And I understand you're right when you said a majority here will agree with you because conservatism goes through cycles. But a majority will agree with me that the isolationism that took place in the lead up to World War II cost us more American lives, cost us more American resources than if we take that bastard out earlier and addressed it earlier, okay? I don't know how this ends. I don't know how it ends with China. I don't think Eisenhower knew how D-Day was going to end. But you do what's right. And we talk about $75 billion, but we just pissed away $6 trillion. That's not the fault of the Ukrainian people who are just trying to live. What else should we cut? All of our support for Israel, what else should we cut? NATO, what else should we cut? So we should utterly destroy our foreign policy because the nitwits in this country are destroying our domestic policy. Because they won't secure our border, we shouldn't help the Ukrainians secure their border. You guys are buying more into Joe Biden than I am, I can tell you that. <laughs> can I, can I Thank say, you for that. Yeah, go ahead, Charlie, and then we're going to move on to Larry. And as Dennis would say, we have cl clarity but not agreement, right, Dennis? So, 
So in, in light of that, I'll just say, it's, look, this, I'm listening very intently to people that I adore. So I am for uh, aiding Ukraine. Uh, and uh, what is critical for us is that we, we be the big tent that conservatives are. We may differ on this issue, and that's the way it works. In life, there, the only person you will ever agree with entirely is you. <laughs> so, unless well, especially you Especially if you're Dennis. You're schizophrenic. <laughs> I don't always agree with me because I have to go home to my wife, who uh, <laughs> doesn't always agree with me because I'm, I'm married, and that's part of the defining characteristic of marriage. But uh, in, in all seriousness, it's okay. We differ on this. I would like to convince uh, people that I differ with, whether it's Tucker uh, uh, Carlson on this. I was with Tucker in Hungary two years ago. We both were invited to speak there. We both loved it there. And Charlie, whom I adore, so we don't agree on this. Okay. It, 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 it's, it, it is what it is. We'll, we'll, as he just said, quoting me, yes, I believe in clarity over agreement. I, I will only add one thing that was tangentially noted. I think that the current state of affairs in Ukraine, more than any other single thing, has prevented Xi from invading Taiwan. And I, I would so so I would ask the those conservatives who oppose aiding of the Ukrainians, which country invaded by by tyranny would you support? Would you support Taiwan? Would you support Israel? Would you support any of the European countries? In, in other words, at what, there, either you will say, we have so many problems in America, we can't afford to support anyone attacked by tyrants, or I draw my line at the following countries, and then I would simply like to know why. And, and for those of us who do know the history of, of that part of the world, what Seb said is critical. The, the Soviets, the Soviets, it's a Freudian slip, the Russians invading Ukraine, after what they did in the Holodomor, which is their equivalent to the Holocaust, and I say this as a Jew, they have an equivalent, if not in percentage, but in numbers. He said eight million, I thought it was six million, nobody really knows. But these people were starved to death deliberately. This was not a famine. This was induced. By the, by the communist regime, just as Mao induced mass starvation in China. For the Russians to invade Ukraine after what they did in the 30s would be as if Germany were to invade Israel after the Holocaust. It would be the moral and psychological equivalent. So I'd just like to leave you with that. I, I just have to add one, one thing very briefly, because Charlie is a friend of mine, and we're allowed to disagree. We are a big tent. But strategy, which is my thing and has been for more than 20 years, strategy is the art of the possible. The possible. And Charlie's right. We've got problems here. But as long as this nation is run by people that hate it, it will not be solved for two years. The border will be open for two years, let me guarantee you. Okay? It won't be two million, it'll be four million next year. We can't fix this until a certain guy I worked for is back in the White House. And, and let me tell you, I will, I will predict right now, we're not supposed to do predictions, I will tell you exactly what happens with the war in Ukraine. If President Trump is back in the White House, Russia will stop bombing maternity clinics. It, it will just happen. They will stop. President Trump is the first president since 1917, since the Russian Revolution, to say when he saw Russian troops in Syria mucking around, he told Mad Dog Mattis, kill them. Kill them. And we did. We killed more than 200 Russian mercenaries in Syria because they were destabilizing the region. Putin didn't even have a press conference about it. That's how afraid he is. So let me give you an analogy with the border and Ukraine. You have a dispute with your neighbor about the wall that divides your two properties. He's not letting you fix it, and he's going to take you to the court. You're not allowed to fix the wall. 
If you see a stranger being mugged on the street outside and you've got a baseball bat, why would you not give the stranger being mugged a baseball bat to defend themselves even if you can't fix your, the wall with your neighbor? That is exactly what we need to do. Not pallets of cash, ammunition, ammunition, ammunition. Let them fight their 1776 until DJT's back in the big house. Larry Elder. When I was in college, one of my favorite subjects was international relations. And I realized that the toughest job in the world is that of being commander in chief. None of us knows what will happen with Ukraine. None of us knows what would have happened had we not given our aid. All the president can do is manage risks without having a crystal ball. It's a very difficult job. I know this. I don't believe we'd be having this conversation if Joe Biden had not pulled out of Afghanistan the way he did. I also know this, that when the Soviet Union fell, and Sebastian, again, knows all about all of this, when the Soviet Union fell, Ukraine had nuclear weapons. The West pressured them into turning them over and promised that in the event that the Russians invaded, we would defend them. We have double-crossed them. This is exactly what happened with Libya. After the war in Iraq, Gaddafi was scared bleepless, turned over his WMD, is now under lock and key in Tennessee, and we implied in the event that there was a threat to that country, we would assist them. Instead, what happened? Obama joined the French and the British in bombing Libya. That would not have happened had they not turned over their nukes. So we have a promise that we've made to Ukraine to defend them in exchange for them having turned over their nuclear weapons. And we would be double-crossing them if the West did not support them right now. Again, that does not mean we give a blank check. That does not mean we do not try and make sure the money and the weaponry gets in the proper hands. But I believe that what happens in Ukraine will inform what will happen with China and Taiwan will inform what will happen with the Ayatollahs uh, in Iran, and will inform what will happen with North Korea. I believe that they're all watching, and they're watching what the West in general, and what the U.S. in particular will do, and I believe that we ought to stay the course. Okay, Larry, we're going to stick with you, but we are going to move on to California now, and big story out today is that Gavin Newsom, who just a couple of weeks ago promised he wasn't running for president, in 2024 has a massive digital operation. So it seems to me that he is definitely getting in the race. What do you think? You know him better than all of us on this stage running against him. Is he, uh, is he running for president, and will he be successful? Well, he would love to run for president. Virtually every governor of California, with the exception of Schwarzenegger, because uh, legally he could not do so, wants to become president. But let me give you my, my prediction, and this is not, not a particularly popular prediction. They're stuck with Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris ran for president. She bailed out before a single contest. She was chosen because she's a female and because she's black. And for decades, the Democratic Party has trained black people to believe that if something goes south, it's because of systemic racism. If Joe Biden does not make it to 2024, and he won't, and if it is perceived that Kamala Harris, who wants to be president, has been drop kicked in favor of somebody else, especially a white man like Gavin Newsom or Mayor Pete. Black women and black voters are half of the primaries in Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and women comprise an even greater percentage of that half. They will be so livid. They will not vote Republican. They simply won't vote. There is a publication called The Grio, which is a black publication covering politics. And they are livid that Kamala Harris has been, in their view, picked on because of her so-called cackle. They consider it to be sexist and racist, and they believe that Joe Biden gave her a thankless task when they told her to find the root causes of illegal immigration. So if it is perceived by these black voters that Kamala Harris has been pushed aside for somebody else, the party will have hell to pay because they've trained people to believe that if that happens, it's because of systemic racism. So they are stuck with Kamala Harris. She will be the nominee in 2024 if Joe Biden is not. And, and Gavin Newsom is a young man. You have to bide his time because he cannot do it now for the reasons I mentioned. All right, so talking about...
California politics. So Dennis, I want to go to you. you. You live here. You said if schools are failing, pull your kids out of school. I do a morning radio show in Los Angeles, and I've said that maybe we teach a hard lesson to California. Everybody ought to just move if you're a taxpayer, and they'll have no more money left, and we'll teach them the hard way that free markets, California doesn't survive without the people, and then they'll have to change their ways, and everybody can move back. Leave California. What is, what is your answer? It's a great idea. <laughs> but you're here, and I'm here. <laughs> It, it's, I think it's more feasible for, for people to take their kids out of school than to uproot their whole family and leave. But it, one of them is appropriate. However, the number of Californians who would have to leave for the Democrats to give a damn is so large as to be impractical. They don't give a damn if you, every single one in this room stays or moves. They don't. They only care about power and perhaps the tech companies that uh, that are, are in Silicon Valley. Beyond that, they don't care about you or about me. Yeah, it, it, if the if the exodus is is all out outbound, it doesn't matter to them. This is the first time in California history it has lost population. That it has lost a seat in in, in Congress in the House as a result of the loss. It doesn't matter to them in the least. They are in power, they are keeping power, and that is all that matters. And they will raise taxes, and it won't matter to them because the people who really can afford it will not move, and the, and the others might. And it, that's, that's just the reality of it. I'm here, I've asked this all the time because I speak around the country all the time. Why am I still in California? And my answer is, because I have too many people here I love, I've invested my life in, 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 in people in the state. I founded with two colleagues, two friends, a synagogue. I feel bound to be with the people that I teach Torah to every Saturday. These are very important parts of my life. And I just can't say I'm sick of California. Bye-bye, everybody. So it, it is, it, it, and a lot of you are in a very similar situation. But the school, the go. school, is the battleground more than the state, the school. I'm not ready to move. I'm ready to fight, and I think that's what we have to do to save California. And Seb, we talk about this on your show every week. What is your advice for people in this crowd who feel hopeless when they go out and vote, but they still do it? Right? Everybody's voting. How do we save California? Well, you, you listen to her every morning in Grant. I mean, I, I'm seriously. I, 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 she is my West Coast warrior princess, and I know Grant's still in training, but, but he's doing okay. <laughs> and, and what do you do? You, you do wh wh the majority of my calls, I mean, I'm on 300 stations, the majority of my calls out of D.C. are from Californians. They're fighters. I mean, I don't know if they're, they're here. I've recognized, I've recognized one of them. So I, I just, a couple of shout outs to my, my regulars. Uh, Ray, my paratrooper. I don't know if he's here. God bless him. Brent, our poet laureate. And I see Antoinette. Where, where, Brent? God bless. Antoinette. Stand up. This, this is California. This is veteran who every week calls into my show on Thursday to announce where she's going to which Planned Parenthood to be a voice for the voiceless. This is how you save California. Don't ask me. This room is how you save California. And to all the people who doubt and say, you know, after the last election, for about three months I put up with it. And then I just, I just used to blow up on the show when people would ring in or DM me or on social media and say, that's it, we've lost, never voting again, uh, it's over. Really? Is that why the founding fathers vouchsafed not only their lives, their treasure, but their sacred honor. That's the attitude. What did Rush tell us? It is an evergreen in my soundbox that I play again and again and again, shortly before we lost Rush. He said, somebody asked me, when is it time to despair? And what was his response? It's never time to despair. It is un-American, un-American. 
And my empirical proof, beyond the historical, I know the founding fathers are ages, you know, long time ago, and Charlie's going to depress you in a second, he promised me. But when, when to worry, you said when to worry, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. Right, right. So, sorry, I know. But, but here's the point. My empirical proof is where I live. I live in Virginia. Uh, who won Virginia? We won Virginia. That had been utterly written off, totally written off. But it's important to understand how we won it, because God bless him, it wasn't dear old Glenn and his, you know, thermal vest, okay? He was running a super milk toast campaign about getting Virginia back to work after COVID. He refused to come on my show for two months and finally came on for four minutes. And I asked him, are you MAGA? Do you believe in MAGA? I believe in making Virginia great again. Dude, come on, seriously. Why did he win? Because, yes, because Terry McAuliffe stuck his size nine into his gob and said, oh no, parents shouldn't have anything to do with the education of their children. Then the Yunkin campaign took that 11 seconds, turned it into a campaign ad seven days before the election, and Glenn Yunkin had the nows, had the knowledge to do what? To embrace the mama bears. The mama bears won Virginia. It wasn't Glenn Youngkin and the nice hairdo and the vest. It was the mama bears. And if the mama bears can take back the Commonwealth, anything is possible, even in California. Seb, can I just add about Antoinette? So she calls in our show, too. And it's not just Planned Parenthood. She went after she the FBI. She likes my show better. I'm not sure about that, but we, we can ask her afterwards. Uh, the FBI, she was out there yes. protesting. M Mark wants to say Mark. Well, I do despair from time to time. I'm not a Pollyanna about these things. Rush and I, from time to time, would disagree about these things. But he despaired, too, from time to time. If you get California back, it's not going to be because of us. It's going to be because of the Democrats. You keep talking about sex changes to Catholic Hispanics. <laughs> and we're going to get 60% of the Hispanic vote. Because the elite white ivory tower Ivy School leftists who run the Democrat Party have absolutely nothing in common with the Hispanic community, or most of us for that matter. So they pushed it too far. They're out of the closet with this crap. They're teaching our kids pornography. It's not party. Most people don't sit around and think party. They sit around and think, what are you doing to my kid? And that's Virginia. But I. But I also think it's not because people coming into this country newly minted who can barely speak English, who can barely speak Spanish, are concerned about separation of powers in Article Two of the Constitution. You have a lot of Americans, third, fourth generation Americans who speak perfect English, who don't know what we're talking about half the time when we're talking about the Constitution. I'm going to tell you what I think. The Democrat Party has become the funnel through which all these Marxist movements are operating now. Whether it's the degrowth movement, that is economic socialism, whether it is the destruction of the nuclear family, which is a must, which is exactly what's going on right now, whether it is racism with critical race theory. Again, newly minted people of color in this country, they don't want to deal with critical race theory. They've escaped tyranny. They don't believe America is a tyranny. They've escaped tyranny. Whether it's Central or South America, Eastern Europe, or the Middle East, they're going, what the hell's going on? That's why in Deerfield, Michigan, you had all those Muslim parents turning out on that school board and saying, you do what you want in the privacy of your home. You keep your hands off my children. There are things, there are things that unite Americans. Decency, morality, faith, family. It so ha happens the Democrat Party's against all of them. 
and it's become a radicalized party. So I'm not saying don't vote. I'm not saying don't fight. I would never say that. We have children and grandchildren to defend. We have men and women who've given their lives, and you see wounded warriors in tunnel to towers. Don't tell me what's the point of voting. Somebody just died or lost a limb so you can vote. Whether you're in a Democrat community or a Republican community, you make your presence known. You go there proudly. I say vote early. Use their system against them. Don't wait around. Get out there. Vote as fast as you can. You're the precinct worker. You go out there and make sure as many people vote as possible. And you do have surprises, like in that district in Texas, which had been Democrat for 111 years. And a Mexican-American woman who was born in Mexico's husband, say, Border Patrol agent, won that district. Don't wake up. I'm almost done. Don't wake up Wednesday morning and find out you've got three or four tight races in this state. And don't wake up and say, geez, if I had voted, you know, we lost by 16 votes. That can happen. I saw a Senate race, 86 votes in the 1970s. 86 votes. I saw a congressional race in New Hampshire, six votes. You saw one in New York where they were duking it out, 112 votes. Your vote matters. You may not think it matters. You don't know how it's going to end. People say to me, are we going to win? And I say, get off your ass and fight like hell. How do I know? All right, so Charlie, I want you to answer about California. Uh, that'll be the last question. Then we're going to do a speed round. Jen has a question. This will be fun, the, the speed round next. But, uh, Charlie, your thoughts on California? Yeah, I mean, I, I love the fight in California Patriots. I see it every time I come here. And I, I think that, look, it's going to be a long-term project, obviously. It's not going to happen immediately. Larry deserves a lot of credit for running for governor and actually answering that call. He deserves a lot of credit for that. It, we need... We need we need more candidates to rise up. That's why I supported the recall, regardless of the odds against us, is you have to continuously challenge the regime. Look, long-term projects are possible, okay? If you look at how the kind of electoral map was 10 or 15 years ago, states like Florida, which actually used to have more registered Democrats than Republicans, they're now deep red. In fact, Florida is now more conservative than Georgia. So you're seeing a lot of movement happen. And yes, the Hispanic community is going to terrify the Democrats so fast so quickly that wall is going to be built in the next five years because Hispanics are moving to the Republican Party in a way that we've never seen before. So look, it has to start local. I think that you're going to flip some congressional seats here in California. I'm confident of that. Uh, coming up in the next eight days, I think I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm, I also know a lot of people running for school board, a lot of city council races. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to the amazing churches that are doing work around here, Jack Hibbs Church in particular doing an amazing job and so look the democrats would love for you to do nothing but despair and if you feel called to move out of california we'd love to have you in arizona with soon to be governor carrie lake we have a lot we got plenty of bad californians coming in but i'm not saying i recommend that because i actually think there's some it's the there's a moral argument to be made to fight for the state where you made the money and to fight the state where you raised the family and not just abandon it so i love the fight in california patriots it's really, really inspiring. I'm not ready to give up on California, obviously. And I want to thank all the people in this room who voted for me, who donated to me. Salem, Salem was behind me 100%. Ed Asher maxed out, helped in enormous ways. Eddie Simon, the TMJ doctor, also supported me. So many people in this room supported me, and I want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart. The, we were talking about the establishment party, Sebastian and Charlie, and I smell what you're cooking, as my little brother used to say. Uh, the party wanted Kevin Faulkner uh, in the recall election. Uh, several people told me that Kevin McCarthy urged all of the members of the Republican House delegation to support Kevin Faulkner, the two-term mayor of San Diego. When I got into the race, the grassroots went nuts. They supported me. I got three and a half million votes. I carried San Diego County by 30 points. But they never endorsed me. The party never endorsed me. They stayed out of the race. Uh, and I lost, in quotes, by 24 points. 
Look at what Donald Trump did in 2016 and in 2020 in California. He lost by 30 points. So we outperformed Donald Trump here in California. And, and Joe Biden and Hillary uh, did not get some $200 million, which is what Gavin Newsom got. And Obama didn't come in for those guys. Uh, Kamala Harris didn't come in for those guys. Uh, Bernie Sanders didn't come in for those guys. All this firepower was used against me. And he ended up having Gavin Newsom spending $9 per vote to retain his job, spent $6 per vote to keep his job. So by any stretch, it was an extraordinary, extraordinary race adventure. And I want to thank all of you for helping me. Okay, so our speed round starts now. And Larry, you gave me a great uh, introduction into that. I'm breaking the rules. There's only one question that goes to you in the speed round, and then we're going to get to everybody else here. Are you running for president in 2024? Put it like this. It's a yes or no. <laughs> the warrior princess has spoken. You're, you're, you're talking to a talk show host. We can't do anything in a yes and no. Uh, I am strongly considering it. Okay. So this is how the speed round will work. You've got to give a one-word answer, and I know this is difficult. So, Dennis, we will start with you, and we'll go down the line. Who will be the Republican nominee in 2024? So I am asked. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. oh, there goes one the word one word answer. Is answer. <laughs> that, that a contribution? Yeah, it's not, apparently, yeah, a contribution. That's adorable. Yeah. It's a two dollar bill. Two dollars. Uh, that's yeah, really good. You should keep it. Len keeps me in business. Thank you so much. So I appreciate I, it. God bless you. Uh, how how much do you want us to spend? A minute, a half a minute? I want one word. One word. One name. This Who is the be, speed okay. round. I, a one word. I don't word know. Answer. I never make predictions. I will support any Republican who is nominated because any Republican is better than any Democrat. That's all you need to know. Sue, so is he good at games of the family dinner too? <laughs> all right, Seb, who is the one name that will be on the ballot in 2024? Oh, is this really a question? I mean, like, uh, I don't think I'm breaking news here. He's running, and if he's running, he is the nominee. All right, Charlie. I think Jeb Bush will be the nominee, actually. <laughs> Jeb! Yeah, I'll be Trump, and I, you know, as soon as Trump announces, I'm 100% behind him, and you should be, too. Mark? I have to disagree a little bit with Dennis. I could never vote for Liz Cheney, as an example. <laughs> okay, so nobody plays the game right, so we're going to try this again. One-word answers. Is... Cheney! Cheney. <laughs> no. Will the GOP win the House, the Senate, none or both? Larry, start with you. Both. Dennis? I don't know. He doesn't make predictions. I know it's frustrating for you to hear. I don't make predictions. I fight. That's all I know to do in life. Seb? That's why, as a Catholic, I call him my rabbi. Um, <laughs> I, not my answer, because again, predictions, you know, mugs game. Uh, smartest guy in polling, Rob uh, Kahaley, Trafalgar, yes and yes. Absolutely, and I trust Rob. Charlie? Yes and yes, but be careful for election day traffic jams. I'm telling you, we're broadcasting. Who's going to vote on election day? Raise your hand. That's a big problem. We're not ready for that. They're going to run out of ballots and ink, and there will be lines that will deter voters. So I hope we're ready for that. In other words, vote early. I don't make predictions either, but we're going to win both. Good, I like it. Who is, oh, actually, I'm going to ask you my fun question down the row. Is Joe Biden evil or demented? Is it what? Is it what? Is, it what? is Joe is Biden evil or, or demented? demented? Yes. Larry? I, I would I prefer the word stupid. Okay. Stupid. Dennis. Which is almost as bad. <laughs> Dennis? It's irrelevant if he's demented, because if he were not demented, he would be just as awful. And that's what you have that's why I said I will vote for any Republican over any Democrat. It has become a party that does bad and only bad. I'm sorry to say that I grew up a Democrat. 
the, e the easiest way is forget the last two years. Just watch the Clarence Thomas hearings. Biden has always been an evil son of a bitch. Mark? What was the question? I can't so hear Biden down it. Evil or demented? Evil or demented? He's a leftist. That's all I know. <laughs> Same damn thing. <laughs> all right, one last question. Can California be saved? Larry? Say again? Can California be saved? Didn't we do this already? Yeah, eventually. It, yes? it's, it's like a drug addict. It's got to hit rock bottom on crime, on homelessness, on the quality of, of education, the, the, the cost of living here. People are leaving for the first time in 170 years, and eventually people are going to have to wake up. Uh, I, I support. So that's a yes. I support term limits, not not for politicians, but for voters. After you voted Democrat two or three times, you're now disqualified from voting. <laughs> if the Ukrainians can defeat the Russians, we can defeat the left. American patriots can't do anything, so yes. Yes. Believe it or not, it's more daunting than the Ukrainians beating the Russians, but I, <laughs> I say yes. All right. So that's going to do it for us here. Um, I think I speak on behalf of everybody up here. We are so humbled that you tune in and listen to us every day. And it is really the greatest gift that I'm given every day is your support. And God bless every one of you for, uh, for that. And I think I speak for everybody up there. Absolutely. And a big special thank you to our sponsors today, the great folks over at Midas Gold Group, DeHart Construction, Californians for School Choice, The Epic Times, Gunslinger Auctions, and Southwest Construction. Thank you all for your support for making today possible. How about a big round of applause? Uh, hang on, hang on. Let's hear it for Jen and Grant. Come on, guys. Thank big you. round of applause for Larry Elder, Dennis Prager, Sebastian Gorka, Charlie Kirk, Mark Levin. We ask if you please clear the path and stay in your seat while the panelists clear the stage. Thank you so much for coming. The new iPhone 14 Pro. It's amazing. And you'll get our best deal. Nice. But every business should get it. Every business can get it. Every new customer. Every existing customer. Every iPhone. Every iPhone. Okay. My work here is done. We are now back with a special guest, the legendary Washington Post journalist for 50 years. Bob Woodward has two Pulitzer Prizes to his name, 10 books about presidents, presidents ranging from Richard Nixon, the Watergate scandal we all know, all the way up to Trump and Biden. 
He has now released eight hours of journalistic audio drawing on his 20 Trump interviews where we hear more from the former president himself, sometimes behind closed doors in the midst of what we know now were quite controversial days of his presidency as it came to its one term ending. There's the week after the murder of George Floyd. There's the clashes over what to do about policing in America. There was the mayhem for that photo op across the street from the White House. Indeed, it was just days later when Bob Woodward asked then President Trump this. I mean, we share one thing in common. We're white privileged who, and my father was a lawyer and a judge in Illinois, and we know what your dad did. And do you have any sense that that privilege has isolated and put you in a cave to a certain extent as it put me and I think lots of white privileged people in a cave and that we have to work our way out of it to understand the anger and the pain particularly black people feel in this country. You no, you, you really dragged 